that make you feel like a rock star. Tim and I were out at the beach, and some tour bus came over, and all the old ladies were coming up, and we were posing for pictures with them <laughs> at the bay. <laughs> well, those are our special guests. Come in, ladies. Yes. <laughs> All right, and welcome back. This is episode five of Mini Biking Ain't Easy. It's hard to believe that we're already at five, which is pretty quick. Uh, to thank, I've got my main man, Zane, producer over here. I got Bernie on the ones and twos. What up, what up? And then we have a special guest, uh, the owner of Go Power Sports, a.k.a. Pops, David Merrill. How's it going? Doing well. Good to be with you. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, had time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us. <laughs> what was the meeting before this? I think he was out golfing. Was that right? <laughs> yes, it was a golf outing. Okay. All business, though. <laughs> okay, we're well, good. Well, I'm glad you're back. So, a few questions. So, you're my dad. Yes. Is that a question? That, <laughs> that's like a lead-up, really. So, how long have you been with the karting company? Uh, started, of course, uh, Rockwood Go-Karts uh, in 1987. Uh, I was still in the military at the time, so worked down at the go-kart track part-time. Uh, really just running the, the, the carts, keeping them maintained. And we did very little sales at that time, but we, we were doing some go-kart mini-bike sales as well. And so military full-time. You are then part-time at the go-kart track. Yes. My recollection is because you had to put diapers on me. That was it. Uh, uh, E5 in the military wasn't making real good money and uh, needed some extra money, so that's what it was all about. So why the go-kart track out of all the other places around? You know, they had an ad in the the base paper, so it was right there, and it seemed like something kind of fun to do uh, rather than work at retail uh, the go-karts had some appeal, so I went down there to take a look at it, and it looked looked like a lot of fun, and Tim was there, and his dad was there, and I uh, talked to him, and after about 15 minutes, uh, started the next day. So Tim is the co-owner that's with you now. Yes. So that is interesting, because growing up I, in business schools, I'm always told <clears throat> that uh, partnerships are, I guess, don't really last, or they're very hard. There can only be one person, but you and Mr. Tim have been at this for decades, can you explain that dynamic and how it works? Uh, you know, we're a lot alike as far as our conservative values and all that, but we we really each bring a different set of skill sets. Uh, Tim is a an excellent mechanic, really has an engineering type mind. The way he he can put things together, figure them out. Uh, my strong suits are really dealing with the customer and more with sales. So really. We overlap some, but really I take care of the sales portion of it. And uh, and Tim, he does a lot with the engineering. He's developed some, some really good new products. Uh, that, that 40 series torque converter kit really comes to mind. That's been a, just a huge success. And uh, that was 100% Tim on that. He took the 30 series kit that had been around forever from Comet and uh, made a heavy duty plate did all the engineering and came out with just a fantastic unit. And uh, there's been many other examples of that as well. So before you jump on with uh, with Rockwood Go-Karts, did you have any uh, experience with mini bikes or go-karts before then? You know, I never owned one as a kid. We had them in the neighborhood, uh, some go-karts and mini bikes. So that was really my only real uh, experience with the go-karts and mini bikes. Uh, in high school, we had we did have a Honda Trail 50, and we had a three-wheeler. Uh, we had a place up in Michigan, uh, vacation up near Mackinac Island, and we'd go ride them occasionally. Didn't work on them a whole lot, but at least had a little experience. Nice. What was the interview like when you walked in? Were you just like, hey, I'm just looking for something to do to get some diaper money, or... Did you walk in and they were like, we like the cut of your jib? <laughs> really, they had an ad in the paper. They were, most of the part-time employees were military people, Air Force from out there at Carswell. Uh, it wasn't a real formal uh, interview, as I recall. We talked a little bit. Uh, I hit it off with uh, with Tim's dad, Ray, 
he was a military guy as well, Air Force, and uh, talking about my time in the uh, in the Philippines and vulcanizing, and uh, he really liked that, and it we really just kind of connected personality wise, and they said, "Come on out." Nice. Honestly, I think that's how my interview went exactly a year ago. It was like really just, hey, come Pretty hang out for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's how we are. It's, it's more of a feel thing than a real uh, granular uh, what have you done and what could you do. You don't yeah. pull out that microscope and like. No, it's, you know, relationship seems to be the most important thing. You, once you do a little bit of homework on somebody like Bernie and yourself, and you know what their abilities are. The biggest thing is, do you, is this somebody you think you can work with? So after you get hired on, uh, last or the first podcast, we had Taylor talk about one of his fondest memories that he knows of the track, and, and that's you throwing a, a, a wrench at a go kart, <laughs> which has been circulating around anymore. Do you? Is there any other special moments that you can think of growing up at down at the track? You know we. It, it was a little bit different atmosphere back in the eighties than it was than it is now. Uh, north side of Fort Worth, uh, there was some gang, gang activity. We we had the uh, we call them gypsies that would come through and they would they would make our life rather rather hard. They were always pushing the envelope. Um, I heard uh, Taylor talk about we anytime you guys wanted something to drink or whatever. We made you go out and look for uh, coins on the track. <laughs> well, the biggest thing was to get you out of our hair for a while. <laughs> It'd take you an hour or two to find enough coins to be able to go buy something. <laughs> so we got quite a charge out of that when we would send you guys out there looking for coins. <laughs> okay. uh, how old were you when you started at Rockwood? Uh. Well, in 87, I was 26 years old. I'd been in the military for eight years. Uh, so, yeah, I was 26. And uh, and I actually I separated from the Air Force in 89. Okay, gotcha. So 26 years old, so that's 87. Then, to my recollection, it's only a few years later to where you and Tim then go into cahoots and wanted to try to buy out Ray. Is that correct? Uh, really, I was, getting out of the I was getting out of the military either way. I was a firefighter in the Air Force, and I had some friends that were at DFW uh, Fire Department, and I had taken all the tests to go to DFW, and I was, I was up, I'd been accepted for a position there, and then Tim and I were speaking, and Tim had, had talked to his father about, you know, buying him out. And there was another brother, Steve, that was involved at that time, and uh Tim got with me, you know, before I committed to the uh, fire department to uh, see if I wanted to, you know, to join him and his brother Steve. After thinking about it, it, I saw a lot of potential, you know, not just the track, but we were doing some sales and uh, we had a, a pretty good area where we were selling the Manco go-karts at that time. So I was intrigued by the sales portion of it. The family dynamics of working with uh, Ray, uh, Tim's father, turned out to be a a little testy. <laughs> uh, so when I got out in 89, I went on full time as as soon as I got out of the military. And then we started the negotiations with uh, with uh, Ray. It took us till 96 to actually come to terms. Mm. Uh, so during that time, there were some ups and downs. and But we, but we worked through it. So in 96, we actually signed the paperwork to, to buy him out. We bought all the shares and everything that came with it. Back in those days, that was just rental property. It was like a $1,000 a month lease, so it was pretty cheap. But before we actually took over, the Leonard family that owned the property, they wanted to sell it. We could have bought the whole, well, from the where the track is all the way up to Jacksboro Highway. Money was pretty tight at the time, and we couldn't commit to that that kind of payment, so we just bought two acres right there where the track is, actually two and a half acres. So with that secured, the property, then we came up with a figure, we paid his father, we were making payments to his father, he carried the note, and then we ended up, after a couple of years, business was really good, and we were able to pay him off in full, and then just kind of moved on from there. 
So it's Rockwood Go Kart Track. You start doing sales. Is that thing karting distributors? Yes. And that's wholesale units of Manco Go Karts. It was the Manco, and we also ran the retail under the karting distributors as well. Okay. Uh, then we get to later in the 2000s, 2006, 2008. You decided to start Go Power Sports. Yes. So how, so you went from Rockwood Go Karts, karting distributors, and then we then add Go Power Sports to that. Really, Rockwood and Cardi Distributors were all going at the same time. We were both going at the same time. It was something that Ray had developed. Really ran the go-kart and mini-bike track during the nice weather. And then he was looking for something to keep the keep employees around. So that's what the Cardi Distributors, mm. they started manufacturing their own concession carts and uh, bringing in the Manco carts. Most of those sales were to dealers in the area uh, during Christmas time. So that kind of... That way you keep people on the payroll year round. Okay. And then so when does Go Power Sports come into play? Go Power Sports the idea probably started around two thousand six, two thousand seven. We'd gone through Manco, we'd gone through Bristers, we'd gone we'd always sold other people's product. And as when they were doing well, you know, we did well, but especially like Manco, that was a big part of our business. Once they went to sell to the mass merchants, that really hurt our dealer base and our our numbers went way down because of that. And they ended up filing bankruptcy and selling. And we were with a couple other companies as well that we didn't really have control over, over what we sold. We sold what they sold. So minimum margins, if they decide to bring on people that could compete with us, we really didn't have much to say in it. So that's where Go Power Sports, something we could control ourselves. Uh, so Tim and I, we talked about it, and we had a, a web person, Bob Smith. You probably remember Bob. He was very instrumental in putting this thing together. But we took our basic carding distributors catalog and, uh, and took pictures of everything and had rough layouts in a catalog form, and then we, we put that on the website. In the early days, we sold Manco go-karts as well, which we sold a lot, and we did well. They just weren't packaged really good, and... Um, it proved to be a little troublesome for the consumers to be able to unpack them and get them running in good shape. So we kind of backed off of that. In hindsight, if we would have kept that going, we probably would have had a real big retail uh, whole unit uh, business right now because we backed out of that altogether and really just did the parts. And with the parts, mm -hmm. I started off just making connections with uh, some vendors from China two vendors in particular, and had them send small numbers of parts over, like torque converters, clutches, some high-moving items. We put them on the Internet, and uh, they sold rather well. And we tested everything rather well before we, you know, really committed to selling a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And they all tested out well. And as our numbers grew, we did more and more that we brought in from China. And then once it came time to start writing some big checks, uh, I went over there to, to personally visit these vendors. At that time, we were working with Hammerhead. Another, they had, Hammerhead has a factory in China. Uh, Holmes G, who owned it, was a, he was a good friend, and we sold a lot of his product. Uh, so I went over there and met with him, went through the factory. He kind of got my bearings on and some do's and don'ts of China, and he got me on the train uh, where I had... I just took the high-speed bullet train and uh, was set up to meet vendors along the way. Uh, fortunately, everybody was there when they were supposed to be there and and uh, and led me around. I don't speak the language at all. Once I'm there in Shanghai, I'm starting to think, you know, I, I sure hope these guys are honest and, and up and up because otherwise I can't communicate with anybody or, or know where to go and... Uh, but that first trip was really good. Saw di four different vendors. They couldn't have been nicer. They picked me up from the hotels, uh, fed me well, showed me their facilities, met a lot of their families. And still today, when I go over the, to China, very good relationships. We always go out to eat. Uh, the families come along. Uh, it's a really good experience. I, I really enjoy going to China. Have you guys ever gone to China together? No, we have not. Oh. Uh, Tim and I went... Brought Tim over last time. Uh, we, we went over with Trailmaster, uh, Mike, one of the owners over there. Uh, and he showed us around a really good time. 
we saw the vendors, plus we went over to a Hong Kong and spent time there. Uh, Hong Kong's gorgeous. I it really is. Kong. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. They make you feel like a rock star. Tim and I were out at the beach, and some tour bus came over, and all the old ladies were coming up, and we were posing for pictures with them <laughs> <laughs> at the bay. <laughs> well, those are our special guests. Come in, ladies. Yes. <laughs> But no, that hopefully that's on the books at some point because I definitely would, do want to check out China. I do want to see the other side of the operations. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. In the warehouses, I, I know you plan on going sometime this year, but hopefully within the next couple of years, uh, you ha- you save me a, a plane seat so you and I can go check it out. We definitely will. The way I'm doing it now, since mom's a Fili- Filipina and we go to visit the Philippines occasionally, this summer I'm going to the Philippines, and that's a pretty long flight. And China's only another four hours away, so it makes it real easy to go from the Philippines to China, then come back. But, you know, that's my hope that you and I will take a stop at the Philippines for a little bit and then then head over to China and and let you meet everybody. So one of the misconceptions that a lot of people had, and I know that I had, especially with you going to China, is that anything bought from China is cheap. But when you go on this trip, you then realize, well, it's only cheap if we ask it, if the consumer asks for it to be cheap. But China in itself can make quality products up to specs if you ask them to and are willing to pay that. Oh, definitely. And that was one of the first vendors that I dealt with at the uh, at the clutch factory. You know, I can sell you what you want. I can sell you a $4 clutch. I can sell you a $6 clutch. I can sell you an $8 clutch. I'll sell you the $4 clutch if you want it, but I'm telling you right now, you probably won't be happy with it. The labor involved, the material that's used, uh, it's up to you to choose what you, what kind of quality you want. And we made that very clear with all of our vendors. We want the top quality. It's only a couple dollars more, and the extra cost is more than really out what... The benefit is you just don't have the returns. You don't get a bad name. You sell it one time, you're done with it. What's expensive is selling something cheap, and then you get a bad reputation. You have to send a replacement once, twice, three times. It just costs you more in the long run. And that's one thing I think that Go Power, has a, Go Power Sports has a leg up on a lot of other businesses like eBay and Amazon because, yes, they will sell stuff cheap, but when people buy from us, they know that we're testing it. They know that we're asking for the highest quality grade at the best price possible because we're going to buy it in bulk. So I think that is a great thing for the consumers to know that, no, we're not just out there buying as cheap as possible, flying it in, shipping it in, and trying to sell it to y'all. We're actually going through and testing it all and make sure that if it's something that I would personally put on my bike, I also want you to be able to have, you know, the same benefits as well. That's absolutely true. If if we're going to sell it, it's going to be something we would use on our own. Uh, it, again, it's just too expensive selling something cheap. You, you don't save any money. Yeah. It costs you money in the long run. Uh, we research things. We buy most of the main parts we buy, we're buying directly from the manufacturer we're not buying from the trading company. We, we go to the manufacturer. We talk to the owners. We talk to the engineers. We see their testing facilities. We give them specs that, that we're looking for. Uh, and we're really happy with, with our relationships. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after these messages. Zane, have you seen the nitrogen shock around? Thanks. This is Jason over here at Go Power Sports, and today we are showing you the high performance billet shock from Go Power Sports.
difference. This is 11 inches from mounting hole to mounting hole. This will hold a 10 millimeter bolt. So here at the shop, we put these shocks on just about anything we can. Right here, we have it on a Megamoto 80 frame. This is customized. We have our own little swing arm that we've created that will be available soon. These are an adjustable preloaded spring, so you can adjust how hard or soft you want your ride to be. These are nitrogen filled from the factory. Now these are exclusive at gopowersports.com. Make sure to pick up a pair of these nitrogen shocks and we'll get them shipped straight to you. Later. All right, and we're back. So Dave, I just wanted to ask, is there anything you learned from running the business that you put into your practice as a father and vice versa? Is there anything you learned as a father that you brought or bring every day into the business? Really the go-kart track and really go power sports even, you learn a lot of patience. Dealing with customers, dealing with employees, uh, dealing with vendors, and that really try to bring that to the family as well. You know, you have to have a lot of patience when when raising children, when dealing with wives, dealing with relatives. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing. Uh, as a young person, I may not have always had a, a lot of patience, but between the home life and the, the business, you, you really need to listen to people. On the business side, you know, you really need to learn that you, you don't know everything. And uh, what Tim and I have really tried to do is we bring people along that that can add to our skill set, be it uh, marketing people, people that can learn, people with uh, with skills as far as with a camera, uh, people like yourselves. We're not really strong IT people. We've become better and better, but you know, people with that kind of experience can just help grow the business. You know, you keep your circle really small. There's only so much you can do, but as you open up your horizons, it really it really increases what you what you have the ability to, to put out there. And giving back is a big part of what you guys do here. We do, we, uh, we, don't, we don't toot it a whole lot, but we, we do, we feel really strong about, about giving back. Well, especially it, with like raffle, we just set off a, a raffle bike, number nine out of 10 for Teen Life. You guys give back to Teen Life. Do you wanna, do you wanna tell us what, what Teen Life is? You know, Teen Life is a great organization the, the people that run it are, are very passionate. You know, Chris Roby, his heart is really in helping these kids out, you know. Listen to the stories from the kids when they talk about, you know, the tough times they've been going through. And uh, they get hooked up into these mentoring programs at school. And the teen life facilitators come in and give these kids an outlet. Give them a way to express what they're going through help give them the tools to how to deal with it. It really warms your heart and they're just, they're growing. They're just, I'm not sure how many schools are in. Uh, I know it's over a couple hundred and what they do is just, it's phenomenal to see. They're really making a difference out there. And, and yeah, we do the raffle bikes and we do some other programs with them to, you know, it's all about raising some money. They can't do it without some funds. So that, that's a real good organization. You know, another one we help is the uh, Northside High School. We've done mm -hmm. that for quite a few years. And that community is really where the go-kart track is at, and that's really why we chose them. Those families, those kids, they've supported the, the go-kart track through all these years. So we want to give back to that community. And when you go inside the schools and you see these kids and you talk to the teachers, again, really passionate. I mean, it's a low-income neighborhood. But there's just so much love out there and so much uh, so much giving and the teachers care so much about the kids, the principal does. It's really good to give back to those people. So that's the Northside High School Legacy Fund. And you chose Northside because Northside is basically the closest high school to Rockwood go-kart track. And a lot of those students funnel into there, into the go-kart track. And they are always out there spending money, hanging out, having a good time. Sometimes they're even employed there when they get older. So you, that's the reason why you chose Northside, because that, that high school, really, we see those kids from elementary all the way up to adults and bringing their kids, which is just amazing to see. And what you specifically do, which is uh, uh, amazing, is that you then do the Rockwood 
uh, go-kart scholarship. And what people should know is that uh, every year there's a panel of five of us and you go in and you basically interview five or six kids and they tell you everything that they've done, uh, their accomplishments and why they need our help going to the next level, uh, going to uh, college. Why do we feel like this is important to them? And, and I guess, can you, I guess, share a little more thoughts on that? Like you said, it's just, it's, it's really, it really makes a reality when these kids are telling you their story. They're telling you about not only what they've done in school, but they tell you about their home lives. Uh, a lot of them are raised by single single mothers. Uh, there may be some some people that aren't that aren't legal, and if you're not if you're not a legal person, you're very limited in the funds you can get for schooling. Uh, and we try not to discriminate against anybody. If it's if they have a need and they've and they've they're working hard towards it, we try to help as many as we can. Mm -hmm. Another thing, like you mentioned at Northside uh, High School, I think just about all of our part-time people, they're currently, or they were, have been uh, Northside students. Uh, shout out to Jose Gonzalez. He, he, he's an alumni from Northside. He came to work with us part-time as a, a little bit of a troubled youth and all that, and, and this guy is just flourished. He's a uh, He's taken these young kids under his wing. He's just a fine example of, of what somebody could make of themselves. And he, he, he really mentors and fathers these kids. And as a manager for us, he just does an outstanding job of, of taking care of the business. I mean, he runs it like his own. Nice. And so then I guess going back to the uh, raffle bikes, since we just did number nine, we then have our last mini bike up for raffle coming up at Pate yes. on April 27th through the 29th. You want to tell us a little bit about Pate and that event? Uh, Pate's a real big event. That's one of our biggest ones of the year. It, it's all part of a car show, but with that car show, there's a lot of go-karts, mini bikes, motorcycles, a lot of nostalgia. Uh, it's just a real good time. We rent, I believe we have... 50 or 60 spots, uh, we bring out a King. Shout out to King at his barbecue stand. Yeah. He keeps his, he keeps everybody fed for three days. We'll have a lot of surplus product out there. We sell things at a, at a real good price. We'll have the YouTube folks out there. Uh, we do mini bike rides after hours. We have a lot of fans, uh, customers come out there and join us. It's a really good event. As long as the weather holds up, you can get rain that time of year, but uh, we've been very fortunate the last few years and hoping for another good event out there this year. It seems like it rains like the day before and then the very last day is like perfect for some reason. It's it just every last few years it's been that way. It, it has. Fortunately, we've had a lot of good days and it, it's a real good event. If, if you're thinking about coming out and you want to see some of the nostalgia, uh, bikes, cars, that's a good event to come out to. That's at the Texas Motor Speedway, April 27th through the 29th. Is it free? I guess it's like five or ten bucks just to park, but then you can walk in and it's just like a big open flea market in the parking lot, right? Correct. You can get home decor. You can get a, a light bulb for an old Chevy, seats for an old Novo. Jimmy Hoffa's body. <laughs> <laughs> if you want something old and nostalgic, maybe somebody's junk, uh, yeah. but still. A lot of times that's somebody else's treasure. Yeah. Mm. So then after that, after the paid swap meet, we then have our first annual pull start picnic, which is a mini bike show. What are your thoughts on this? I know you're not <laughs> too deep into the planning. I am not too deep in the planning, but to my understanding, that will be at the go-kart track. Uh, people come down and they can have a good time riding go-karts, miniature golf, if they want to sell their wear, uh, their wares, you know, go karts, mini bikes. If you want to buy something, uh, we'll have quite a few vendors out there. We'll have a lot to to see. I'm not sure if we're going to have any cars out there or not. No cars. Only no cars for this lot. event. Just, Just go karts, mini bikes. I'm wondering if we're going to have enough spots because we're saying that every person can bring up to ten mini bikes to enter in one of six classes. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to teach you real quick. So we got six classes. It's uh, it's rat mini bikes, off road, vintage, wild style, which is anything open, drag, and micro. 
Okay. We're then going to have six special honorary guests be it, get flown in and drive in for like like cars and cameras. Our guys from from California, Arizona. We're gonna have specialty guests, then judge each one of those classes. We're then gonna have our GPS overall picks or the guys from Go Power Sports all convene. We somehow all agree on one bike to be the the top one. That'll be interesting. And then we're also going to have a people's choice to where when people walk in, they'll get two tickets, kind of like because we give two tickets now. So you, you, you come okay. in, you see the Go Power Sports booth. I'll give you two tickets. One ticket, you're going to go into a raffle, which will mean that uh, you could win a Little Rascal mini bike kit undone. Okay. And then we encourage you to, with that, if you win, to go ahead and paint it up, do it up, bring it back, and enter it into the second annual Pull Start Picnic. But then with your second ticket, you're going to go to whichever mini bike you want. Overall, it doesn't matter which class, you can put in a Go Power Sports bucket. And whoever at the end, at 3 p.m., has the most tickets in their bucket will be the overall uh, customer pick. Mm-hmm. Crowd Look favorite. forward to that. Okay. That should be fun. Like you said, uh, I hope we have enough space for everything to take place. <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking like a couple bounce houses, uh, <laughs> four food trucks. Yeah, because Rick alone is bringing 20 bikes from Bus Knuckle Bill. Uh, it's limited to 10. Oh. Him and Brandy. Him and Brandy. Him and Brandy. Okay. <laughs> Which we will allow that. That That is fine. This is our first annual. I'm kind of excited. I'm kind of nervous. I wonder... <laughs> How many people we're going to have out there? <laughs> you know what? It's going to be a learning experience for everyone. Yeah, hopefully we blow the uh, the doors off this thing. Uh, uh, it'll be good. It'll be a good event with with everything there is to do there, with the food trucks, with the go-karts, yeah. with the mini golf, with all the – anytime the community, the go-kart community, mini bike community gets together, it's a good time. And I don't know if you know about this, but then that's on May 20th. Pull Start Picnic is May 20th, a Saturday, from 10 to 4. Okay. But then Sunday, we're then all loading up, going down to Temple, Texas, for our first ever drag mini bike series. Did you know about this? I've heard about that. I didn't know we had a date <laughs> in stone. but uh, <laughs> hey, Busy weekend. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the, uh, yeah. for the heads up. It's hard when you're out golfing all the time. So. Well, that's true. <laughs> and now you can't say no because you're on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> when you have such good people here all the time... I, it, it allows me, frees me up to do that kind of stuff. What yeah. is your handicap now? I'm about a 10 handicap. Very nice. I'd like to get down to single digit. Oh, okay. Okay. One day at a time, right? That's it. That's the reason why you're gone <laughs> throughout the whole week. <laughs> well, I, you know, I just can't seem to break below that 10, yeah. so I, I just got to keep working keep at working it. Keep working at it. Th- that is fine. So, yes, uh, dr- our first drag mini bike weekend will be down at Temple Harley Drags. Okay. Down in Temple, Texas. There'll be Friday, Saturday uh, riding. We'll have the show and we'll have people in town, so we'll, we won't be there Friday, Saturday, but Sunday. Anyone who wants to mini bike drag race with us, against us, we're going to be down there like at 8 a.m. We'll have a booth. Bring your mini bike. Uh, we'll have a link down below just so that you can get more information on this event. Uh, but you know that this year is the year of the drag mini bike, right? Well, of course it is. We're excited about it right now. Taylor is in the midst of coming up with like our little rascal kit, but in a drag frame. And speaking of drag bikes, so last weekend you just saw our resident uh, drag racer, Flacco. And how did he do in his 100-foot debut drag race? He did fantastic. I think it actually turned out to be a 60 or 70-foot oh, man. <laughs> drag. He did fantastic. The The arena they had to drag race didn't have a, was not large enough to accommodate the 100 yards. But I tell you what, he was fantastic. The first couple runs, he wheelied on a few of them, but once he got that dialed in, he was fast. Uh, Rick Watson, he was extremely fast out there as well. There were probably another three or four bikes that they were within tenths of a second. Uh, it was really impressive to see. There were a lot of really, really competitive bikes out there. And what's crazy is because the bike that Flacco on, it, it, that Flacco is on, is kind of like a clown bike because it's a little rascal that's just extended out. And a little rascal is already like a tiny bike yeah. as it is, so he's at a disadvantage. But then again, it looks so cool because it is like a slam <laughs> drag bike as close, it's just as, as close to the ground as possible, which is nuts. Did you get behind or around that engine whenever they fired it up? Oh, I was there. It was rather loud. Okay. 
Yeah, I can feel my soul leave my body every time they rev it up. <laughs> I have a picture of him sitting on the bike. I will uh, throw that up. Okay. okay. Let's throw that up right somewhere here. here. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this is the year of the drag bike, but you've seen this this sport, this hobby, this lifestyle. You've seen this grow uh, from back when you guys were just selling mancos out of the rate out of the Rockwood. Um, where do you see it going? Where do you see mini bike and go kart ownership and the culture that comes along with it going in the next couple of years? I see it on the rise. You know, it, the, the mini bikes have been around for a long, long time, and they were hot and cold. But in the early days, the go karts were definitely uh, much more popular than the mini bikes. But we've really seen the mini bikes, I'd say, in the last five years, really take off. Uh, you know, we sell a lot of the Trailmaster. There's a lot of the Coleman out there. Uh, there's really a lot of product. And with that has really raised the interest. And once people get a, get a taste of it, they really enjoy it. Now we're just going faster and faster. You know, we do the, the stage one kits, the stage two kits, and we try to do it all safe. And, and that's the big thing. We really promote people to wear their protective gear and their helmets. Uh, but there's a lot of these, we call them backyard racing, racers, if you will, a lot of communities. And I think it's, I like to see it. A lot of families are involved with it. It brings a lot of people together. It's fairly inexpensive. And, uh, you know, you have to have some kind of ground rules so everybody is competitive. But I think that's going to continue. Uh, we brought out the Rascal and Little Rascal a couple of years ago, and those have been huge successes. Uh, we bought the Mega Moto where we have the 8105 and the 212. And it started off a little slow selling the kits, but the, they've really hit their stride. Those have become very popular. Uh, Jason put together a kit with the 212 that that has performance package with the engine, and people can buy that real easily now as a, as a complete kit to put together, and they really like that. And uh, I just see it on the upswing. I really do. All right, so for 2023 and Go Power Sports, what are you most excited about? It's probably the drag bikes. You know, that's really what we've been pushing the last couple of months, and there's quite a bit on the table. Uh, I think the drag bikes are probably going to be the biggest thing. On top of that, we're we're really trying to perfect what we're doing out there. We've with the kits and everything that we offer for performance. What, what is the point of the kits? It's to make it more accessible for more people to get onto these things, right? Really, it is. The kits are designed with the idea of making it easier for the, for the consumer to choose what he wants. If he wants a drag set up rather than go through all the different cams, the different flywheels, we've already done the homework for them. So we can give them a nice starter kit. We can give them a, a stage one kit. Or we can give them a real performance kit depending on what, what they want to do what they like to spend on it and the same thing with the off-road kits we've already done the homework so we know what works together and and package it and we package it we try to make a little better pricing and give the consumer what they're looking for mm. yeah because those swing arm kits did really well mm -hmm. yeah the swing arm kits have done really well the the front end kits have done really well and you know shout out to the taylor to to, to mark really everybody in the engineering side they've really done a really fabulous job of, of putting these kits together. Again, everything gets tested out really well. The 180 was a real good test for a lot of these uh, these kits. Uh, those are some hard miles we put on them, and and everything really came through in flying colors. Uh, I think we made a few adjustments, but but these kits are ready to go. So I'm most excited about is that back in November or December of last year, getting an email from Coleman asking us to buy just a whole list of their parts for their CC100 bikes. Do you want to tell us more about that that acquisition? We can a little bit. Uh, we, we've had a good relationship with Coleman for, throughout the years. The, uh, the ownership had actually sold out to an investment group last fall, and the uh, the new investment group, we've got a good relationship with those people. We've had contact. So we're buying enough. We've purchased enough uh, parts to build roughly 15,000 units, be it engines, clutches, chains, fenders, seats. And we're putting together some packages out there, very affordable packages, because we, we, we bought this stuff at a, at a good price. 
to be able to offer these these kits to the consumers, uh, I'm really feeling we can put together some really really attractive kits out there for people that may not be able to afford a you know a brand new Coleman or a brand new Trailmaster, where they're able to do a little bit of work themselves. They can take an old frame and use these parts to put it together, or 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 just we're working on putting a kit together with a frame and all these parts. Should be a real attractively priced uh, set up with that. Will people be able to find those uh, paid? We should be. Yeah, we'll definitely have a lot of parts out there. I don't know that we'll have our own frame. Gotcha. We're really working on putting that kit together with the Mega Moto 8105 chassis. And I think we've got that about hammered out. And there'll be a bunch of those those out there for the paid swap. Nice. Okay. So if you've been waiting to get in on the mini bike game, Pate's a good time to start. It really is. We'll have a number of uh, scratch and dent sales to go along with that as well. So if you're looking for a smoking deal, Pate will be a good place to pick that up. Gotcha. So just to get us <clears throat> in the timeline, okay, so we've already purchased all these parts. We now have a third warehouse where we have just had truckloads by truckloads by truckloads still coming in of all these CC100X and CT100U mini bike parts. Are we still receiving in trucks? Are we, do we have everything yet? or No, we don't. We received two trucks this week. I'm thinking we're down to the last five or six truckloads. Okay, because I know that we've already opened up a little section on our website for Coleman parts, but we have even more parts that we need to add to here. Oh, Is that correct? definitely. Uh, yeah, check us out. You want some, some very well-priced uh, Coleman parts, we, we have them out there. At, uh, and it really... It makes us feel good to be able to offer these. In- we have these engines on sale for $79. You know, th- that's something that normally retails for $150. We also sell that engine with a clutch and chain kit. And it, it really makes us feel good to be able to offer that kind of product at that kind of price. A lot of people that couldn't afford it, you know, now they can't afford it. And and at the end of the day, everybody wants just to have fun. And as long as people out there having fun and it, it warms our heart, and we make a buck doing it. But it's not a, its just not about making the money. It's—it's it's being able to offer this to people and know they're going to have lifetime memories from it. And this in this uh, seventy-nine dollar engine isn't just a floozy engine. It's a ninety-eight cc engine. It's actually on this beautiful little rascal behind you. So that's the ninety-eight cc engine it has more than enough to pull me around. Where the seventy-nine cc, it, it was good. It was more geared towards younger children, but this 98 CC, I feel like it's a good in between to where a kid can ride it, uh, but definitely an adult like myself can ride it. Oh, definitely. And with a 79 CC, you're limited to just a centrifugal clutch. Mm-hmm. With, uh, with this 98 CC, you can even run a torque converter on it. So if you want to start a young child off on a clutch drive, you can do that if you want to if they're ready to go off-road a little more, you can add the torque converter kit that we have for it as well. Uh, we're working on doing some more performance parts. It'll never be the performance of a 212, but a nice introductory engine where you get people started on it, where they get get comfortable, where you're not scaring somebody, where they don't want to they don't want to continue with it. It's a real nice starter machine, and then they can progress from there. So I can't help but think that 98cc is good on a small mini bike just because it is only two wheels. Have you thought about a small-time go-kart like uh, like the Coleman or the Megamoto K100 or whatever they call it, like the small kids go-kart with that, with that same engine? Have you thought about that? We thought about it. There's really nothing in production right now for it. We do offer a similar version in the Trailmaster, mm. the little mini uh but that's a kit, and even with the cart fab kit that we sell, that's an engine that you could put on there, and it would push you around. Uh, if you wanted to, you could even use it on our vintage kit, mm-hmm. you know, for a younger a younger person that you you really want to limit how fast they go. So we do have some machines you could, or some frames you could put it on, uh, but that's in the works as well, doing a mini go-kart that, that would accept that engine. Nice. Mm-hmm. So changing tack entirely, Jason is a speed demon, from what I can tell. He's someone who is addicted to going fast and being the best at what he does. Were you like that when you were younger? Are you still like that? I've heard that you are very, you're formidable on the racquetball court. 
<laughs> Multiple people have told me if he if he challenges you to racquetball, don't take him up on it. He's very good. I, I do enjoy sports, and yeah, I like to be competitive. Uh, that's just kind of, I think, all of our nature here. We're all pretty competitive people. Uh, yeah, we we always like to go fast. I've, uh, I've got a 69 Mustang that, you know, I like to get out there and run a little bit, have a new vet. Uh, it's kind of fun to go out there and do a little Sunday cruising. And and uh, I'm not near as competitive on the roadways as I used to be. Uh, when I was younger, it wasn't always it wasn't always well thought out. <laughs> uh, you may may or may not have been the person not wearing a helmet riding around. Uh, or... No comment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do as I, do as I say. Not always what I do. But today I'm a little wiser, and I do always wear my helmet and in special gear, and and never go fast unless it's an open road, and never want to endanger anybody else. Mm, gotcha. Have you guys raced recently, or have you guys ever had a race against each other? Myself and Jason? Yeah. I don't know. I don't recall that we ever have. I think the only time we raced was a foot race when I was like four or five years old, and you knew you could beat me. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the oh, only time we really So that's raced. your excuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, then at the Tewksbury, you were covered in mud. So it's like, <laughs> it's I, I don't recall that. Did you that video? <laughs> No, more than anything, I think we've just been uh, not really competitive, but just more companion riding than anything, just hanging out, really. We really have, but it's when we're out riding it, it's more companion riding, be it in Colorado or, yeah. or be it out at the ranch. Uh, and that's really where my heart is these days. It's more into having fun, just out there enjoying the ride. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Who's faster, you or Tim? Because I'm going to ask Tim next week. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in our younger days, oh, we we've always been fairly competitive. Uh, we had a foot race, really, <laughs> down at the go kart track, <laughs> and uh, two hundred pounds uh, ago. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that was a few pounds ago and a few uh, <laughs> a Is few this years ago. We can find on Instagram. <laughs> uh, I don't think you're going to find it. It was probably about a 60, 70 yard, and we lined him up, oh, and uh, he got me. Whoa! He okay. Got me. Uh, he he played football, and he's he's extremely strong when he as far as lifting. Uh, he's got strong leg muscles, and I think I'm I have no doubt if a quarter mile, half mile, I'd have wore him out. <laughs> but in short spurts like that, he owned me. Oh, yeah, okay. Taylor was saying he held like the the bench press record at his high school for the longest. He is. I tell you what, that Yoakum family. They're strong people. They, uh, you don't want to fight with them, but yeah. you don't want to have a lifting contest. Put, put, putting the yoke in yoke them. They right? really do. <laughs> I tell you what, the whole family's that way. <laughs> and what's nuts is they we're surrounded by what twenty yokums out here. Is is that how many yokums work at Go Power Sports? Currently or before? Yeah, currently. <laughs> it feels that way at times. <laughs> there's quite a few. Well, there's also quite a few Merrills as well, right? We do. You have, yeah, you and I and Brother Jeff and... Yeah, what does Brother Jeff do? Uh, Brother Jeff is in Procurement. Okay. Brother you, Jeff is not a member of the clergy, though, right? It's just your brother <laughs> right, Jeff. That's my brother Jeff, Okay, yes. I just wanted to check. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he's He ran the, the warehouse for quite a while, and then uh, now he's in a procurement and, and freeing me up uh, from some of those tasks. So I love having him around. Uh, like with Tim, we have uh, Brother Aaron Yoakum, who's our top-notch sales guy, and, of course, Taylor heading up R&D. So we've we've got family members and really the the other people that work here. It, it's like a big family. It really is. Well, then you got Mom and, and shipping. We've got Mom down there at the warehouse and shipping as well. You can't forget that. Yeah. Occasionally we have Sister Joan uh, down there doing some packing as well. Now, do you want to hold on to this to where your grandchildren <laughs> are working here too? Is that how, do you plan on sticking around for that? You know, at this age, I just don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the long term plan is, but that's definitely a possibility. So you you don't see yourself walking away anytime soon. You know, right now I'm enjoying myself. Uh, business is doing well. I'm able to get away. Uh, I wouldn't call it semi retirement, but I think I'm I'm kind of heading towards that way. Uh, there's some things I need to take care of. There's nothing I do that somebody else couldn't do at some time. So 
uh, we're really in a real good place right now. I can see that being tough because this has been your life for the last few decades. It's been my whole life. Have you thought about what you would do if you were to walk away? You know, Mom and I like to do a lot of traveling. Uh, you know, we do we travel to the Philippines on a regular basis, but we like to travel a lot. We like to do a little more of Europe. Uh, we enjoy Mexico, uh, the Caribbean. I think for the short term, if I were to walk away for any length of time, I could see spending six months a year doing uh, extensive traveling. Mm. You know, I really enjoy being around the family uh, as the grandkids get older and all that. L- like to spend more time with the grandkids and all that and, and uh, participate in their activities and be part of their lives. And They want to go skiing. <laughs> this is where Jason brings out the contract to buy you out. <laughs> Oh, there's a price for everything. <laughs> Trust me, I don't want to see you go. I don't think that uh, you have so much knowledge and you have so much experience that I would be lost without you. So you don't go anywhere so that us three can just hang out up here <laughs> and goof <laughs> off and we should be good. And that's good. We're really in a real good place right now. Everybody kind of has a, a a part of the business that they're, they're responsible for. And uh, it's a real good it's a real good setup right now. And I see it continuing. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back after these messages. Nice. And we're back. So, Dave, what what advice do you have for Jason as, like, a father? I'm sure you guys have discussions outside of work and stuff, but um, it's kind of cool that you guys get to work together. Like, I've never, I like, I've gotten to travel with my dad, but he and I have never really worked together in any way. So it's kind of cool that you guys get to collaborate and work on something. And this is a thing that you guys have been building together for the past decade, right? Now, because you've been working on them. You've been here at GPS. and Yeah, but I mean, even just growing up with it being daycare. So it's yeah. been my whole life around this. Yeah, what kind of advice you got for me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've, we've always had a good relationship. You know, growing up, you down the track. I remember some days you wanted to go. Some days you may not have been really into it because for a young person there's it's fun for a short amount of time but after a few hours it gets kind of old but but you're always there you always did whatever needed to be done you did the travel hockey and all that we've always we've always been fairly close and we were always able to get along talk things out uh, really never had any real problems you know the, the advice I would give is what I've given what I've tried to give ever since you were young is just you know, to treat people like you want to be treated. That's probably the biggest thing. Be kind to people. Do what you're supposed to do. But but don't let them push you around either. I mean, you got to be able to do your own thing. And and you always have to keep your eye on the prize. And and you need to have a plan B in life. You just never know uh, what's going to come up. I know on business, you know, we would be with one manufacturer. But there was always somebody else out there. Uh, when Banco went down, we had Hammerhead. When Hammerhead went down, we had Trailmaster. We were always kind of looking to what's what's the next step. And like you in, in the marketing, you know, you've done a really good job. You've really taken it to the next level. And I know you're, you've taken what you've learned and, and just kind of seen how you could apply it. Some things are successful. Some things, okay, well, they could have been done a little different. But you never know unless you try. And, uh, and I really applaud you. you. You're willing to try things. You have a common sense approach on what you, what you do and how you approach people. The way you treat people is, is beyond reproach. I mean, you, you really do. You treat people like they're brothers and, and sisters, and, and they're part of the family. And that, that says a lot. That warms my heart as a, as a father. 
Well, one of the coolest things growing up that um, I've always admired you on is that you have trusted me 100%, which is nuts because I'm just a kid figuring things out. I don't even have the answer, but the fact that you would instill just trust and faith in me with big things, little things, you would give me the truck and say, go wherever in the U.S. you need to, go haul this around <laughs> at a young age, you know, here's something expensive in the back, or take our brand new <laughs> RV across the U.S. or whatever, and no matter what, you never batted an eye. You always trusted me, and I thought that was the coolest thing because now with my kids, I'm like, there's no way I'm trusting these kids. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that you did it ever since I was at a young age, it's, it's, it's nuts, and I was I'll let you know that I appreciate that more than anything. That's one of the biggest characteristics that, that I've noticed that you've given me, and I was going to tell you that I'm eternally grateful for that. It's like you trust me. You've given me enough rope if I was to, to hang myself or whatever, but... Either way, you're always there for me, so thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And really, that's how it goes. I give you enough, there's enough trust in you, but if you make a mistake, you know there's going to be consequences. And really, I can't think of when you ever let me down on anything. I mean, you you came through, you did what, as far as I know, you did what you said you were going to do, and you didn't get in trouble. And as a child, and I was that my parents gave a lot of trust in me, and kids are going to make mistakes. Yeah. But the kids that can make mistakes, and if you don't go to jail and you don't hurt anybody, that's just part of growing up. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody's going to make mistakes. The parents don't need to know every little thing. Yeah. Uh, and your sister's the same way. She's never let me down. I don't think she's ever done anything <laughs> I don't want her to do. And uh, <laughs> And I appreciate that. It, I appreciate you doing what you say you're going to do and, and making it happen. Yeah, for sure. We didn't get to talk about it much, but how do your and Tim's styles of leadership both work together and also how does it create like good friction that allows you to bounce ideas off each other and to challenge each other? We've really never had a real, we've never had a strong disagreement on anything. We've been able to, to agree on everything. It's it's kind of like if one, one of the other of us will be passionate about something and we have enough trust in each other where if I come to him with something or he comes to me and we want to take the lead on it, you know that person has thought it out and, and it's going to work. Uh, and if it doesn't work, we'll modify it. And if we do make a mistake, I make a mistake, I'll, I'll own up to it and say, hey, this this wasn't a good idea. And Tim has done that as well. We, I may be a little bit too easy at times, and he may be a little harsher at times, just our general personalities. Uh, but you need that mix. I mean, you really do. And when it comes to collaborating, we can get together on just about everything. Well, we can't get together on everything. And uh, our relationship, uh, if we were to walk away from this, we would always be best friends. I mean, um, we've always had each other's backs. Uh, our our kids and all that. It's always you know we've been Uncle Tim and Uncle Dave, and we know our each other's families intimately, and and the kids have all gotten along really well, and uh, just a real good relationship. And I'm really thankful for that that re relationship. Now, if you could look into camera one and just say, Tim, I love you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Tim. It. <laughs> I love you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on. We do appreciate you coming on and hanging out with us. Well, thank you much. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> All right. So that's the end of our podcast, episode number five of Mini Biking Ain't Easy. If you have any questions or comments, make sure to leave a comment down below. Let us know what you want to hear about. If you have anything that was intriguing, definitely let us know. We love to read it. And as always, if you could like, subscribe, and always ride on. <laughs> that was good. That was good.